good evening. Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Alistair Roth. I'm Executive Director of AAA Victoria. Uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, wherever we may be, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And very warm welcome to, to members of the Institute, our other guests, uh, those joining on Zoom and, and members of the Diplomatic Corps. So we'll take questions towards the end on Zoom as usual, just put them in the Q&A tab in the toolbar, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, so to talk about the, the topic of uh, making the British H-bomb in Australia, it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome back, in fact, to Dyson House, Sue Rabbit Roth. Now, full disclosure, uh, Sue is a relative of mine, she was, she was last here in Dyson House at a talk in about 1970, and apparently nothing has changed since in the decor here. Um, Sue is a social scientist. She's widely published in, in political, educational, medical areas. She taught at the universities of Melbourne and Monash in the 70s, before going off to work at the UN in New York, where she was information officer for the petitioning delegation of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. She then went to University of Dundee in Scotland where she taught for 20 years. But for the last 35 years, she's been conducting extensive research on the long-term health effects on participants and observers in UK nuclear tests. She's been effective in winning more than 60 applications for service pensions across UK, Australia, New Zealand and France. So Sue, thank you very much for joining us. The podium is yours. And welcome back. Thank you for coming as Alistair said out on this not very clement evening. And I too would like to um, express my respect and appreciation for the traditional and current and future leaders of Aboriginal communities and other Indigenous uh, communities in Australia and other places. I won't be mentioning much about Aboriginal communities today, although they were critical to the uh, institution of the British Royal, the Australian Royal Commission into British nuclear testing in 1985, 1986. And I am talking about that in Launceston in a couple of days. Uh, well, what I want to look at at the moment is why on earth the British and Prime Minister Menzies insisted on doing what they did right up to a month before the 1956 Olympic Games started. In the 30 years or so that I've been looking at the archival material, I've only ever found one reference <clears throat> to the 1956 Olympic Games in all those archival documents in London, in Australia, in Los Alamos and other places. And that was from um, William Penny on the day that he wasn't able because of inclement weather to do the blast that he wanted to do. And he wrote, or he signaled back to his commanding group in London, um, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Uh, I'm very aware of the 1956 Olympics, but only one mention, one in thousands of documents in, the commentary by researchers has been remarkably missing and in the whole understanding of why they were in such a hurry to do what they did that they would test right up until a month from the opening ceremony. Here's the opening ceremony here. Do you remember that? I remember that. Um, it. Uh, was in the, it was in the, the Melbourne cricket ground, if you remember, and it was open air. I think the stadiums have been closed over since then, but um, I remember those stadiums. Now, there you are sitting there, thousands of uh, athletes, thousands of observers, guests, uh, paying observers to the Olympic Games, just as the winds are blowing over, from the west, from Maralinga, from Emu Field, from Monte Bellows, just as the radiation, if there was any radiation, which of course there wasn't according to most British reports, but if there was, it was just falling on the ground into the food chain of the people who are eating at the 
Melbourne Olympics during those three or four weeks. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the scientists who conducted those tests understood that. And this can be supported by the archival materials. So why did Menzies let them do it? Why did his government let them do it? Why did the British themselves want to do it? Why were they in such a haste that they, even though Chifley had signed on to the Olympic Games when he also agreed uh, to host or accommodate the nuclear testing, atomic testing, as it was referred to inaccurately, as we shall see, uh, back in the 1940s during his prime ministership. The evidence tells me, and I want to tell you, and I want you to tell the world, that in fact, Prime Minister Menzies was a very eager, enthusiastic supporter of the British testing program, that he was very well informed, that they had many meetings with relevant officials in London and in Canberra, that his head of department, Prime Minister Department, Alan, uh, Alan Brown, Alan Brown's name is all over the documents in London and in Australia as the conduit, the, the so, you know, passage through which Prime Minister Menzies was informed. Menzies met with everybody from the Prime Ministers of England, from of Britain, to the scientists, to his own support staff. He was not duped. He was not conned. He was not tricked into accepting the program that he did accept. And there was one very strong reason why he accepted it. And the fact is that he fully expected, as did Chifley before him, to be rewarded with tactical nuclear missiles, if and when Britain should leave the defense of this region, which did of course come about in 1960s uh, when Prime Minister Macmillan and Prime Minister Eden felt that they couldn't support anything beyond the east of Suez. And Menzies shuttled back and forth to London and other places with members of his Atomic Weapons Safety Committee, Safety Committee, pleading for Australia to be left with a uh, an arsenal of at least tactical nuclear missiles. And I've been working on this and COVID was a great opportunity to sit at home with a computer and a bundle of archives, for at least those of us who had been lucky enough to be dumped with a bundle of archives. And I've been working through this and I'm publishing it now online because I feel that online publication these days is actually the most accessible and probably the most lasting form of communication rather than print-based books, much as though we love them, such as uh, Nick's book that is here, which also is online, he was telling me just now. Um, I've got two volumes out. It's about uh, 60,000 words in four different parts, and it's very chronological to show how things developed. And it's rather, perhaps might one, some might say tediously factual, but the fact is that it's embedded and cited to every document that I ever found references and I've quoted those so that other researchers can pick it up, maybe go and cross check it in London or in Australia where there are major holdings here, or at least be educated by it. I worked with a lot of archives over the last five or 10 years in this part of the work, which succeeded after the health studies. And I must say the librarians to a person have been so supportive and so energetic and uh, enterprising in finding me documents. Uh, and the archive at the archivist at the Fenner Library recently uh, in Canberra, I was meeting with her earlier this week, and she managed to find nine missing tapes from Titterton, Ernest Titterton, former uh, professor of physics at Australian National University, which people have been looking for for ages. It's still out there. It's still a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of PhDs to be done. And I want professors who have PhD students and PhD students who are looking for professors and topics to remember that it is so vastly underutilized, the archival research body, and it's so accessible. Um, now I've put out 
in Mianjin of all places, which is not exactly a high class physics journal, although it has its reputation in other quarters. But um, Jonathan Green, who I think has just left the editorship there, he supported my work for several years, publishing all sorts of odd ideas. This is the place you might go if you want to see, well, what was she really saying? Where's the data? Where's the evidence? Because they can only run past it in uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. And it's documented together with some photo photographic images of the actual documents that I took it from. But I have to tell you, the National Archives in both Britain and Australia are easy to work. And I could sit in Scotland all through the COVID epidemic and uh, get a lot of work done, even though I couldn't make my usual six weekly trip to London, which my work had allowed before. There's a particular file that I refer to in the Mianjin article, which is con uh, contains Dear Harold and Dear Bob letters, together with their civil servants input into what should they sh say about a particularly delicate matter that Bob had raised with Harold. Because Sir Robert Menzies, Bob, suddenly became aware that if uh, the Geneva Convention yielded an atmospheric test ban, that would really cripple Australia's chances of doing its own nuclear weapons tests. And since he and Chifley before him had been promised an arsenal to be left by the British, even when they should depart the region, he was saying to Harold Macmillan, um, you can see you've put us in a very difficult position, Harold, because, and this I think is really the, the big headline for the day, what Robert Menzies and his government and chiefly before him agreed to seems to me to have made Australia a nuclear state in the 1940s and 1950s. And I'll just say softly, perhaps even now, the prime ministers raised these very important issues between themselves about what if Australia was left stranded having hosted the test, having irradiated the countryside, um, but got nothing for it. It was a, quite a technical argument that Menzies was making to Macmillan, and I think it requires um, a full constitutional law inquiry into the powers of a dominion state under the auspices of a whatever state, um, such as Britain was, um, it's not like the French testing, for instance, where the testing areas were clearly subordinate colonized territories. Australia was a dominion. Australia had full constitutional structures, which a constitutional lawyer would understand much better than I do. But what Menzies is saying is that if we're not careful, we'll be get, we'll get, Australia will get lumbered with Britain as a nuclear state, and that will prevent us from testing, developing our own materials after you go, because there will be a ban coming down about 1960, and uh, in the early 1960s, as it were. The civil servants here wrote that because of the delicacies of the relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States, which I assume everybody of our generation understands and knows, um, that the British wouldn't be able to share information with the Australians because the McMahon Act in the United States prevented the sharing of American nuclear secrets. And Britain was desperately trying to get back into alliance with Britain for nuclear weapons development. This civil servant said it would have to be done because we are sympathetic, the civil servants are sympathetic to Menzies claims and Macmillan and Eden were sympathetic to the problem that Menzies was putting forth. It would have to be done with the connivance of the Americans. 
if this information was actually secretly given, Australia's use of it would also have to be clandestine. And I hope Richard is listening, that being our dear Richard Tanter, um, my erstwhile peer at Melbourne University 55 years ago, was it? And who, of course, has revealed and established so much important information about the extent to which a military, American military presence exists in Australia, which looks to be on the surface as being one of communications issues and such like. But actually, when you look closely at what's going on at Woomera, may actually be a preparedness stance for what some people call a forward defense of the United States, but other people call a forward defense. Uh, what I'm saying is that one man's forward offense is another man's forward defense. And that's a position that Australia has allowed itself to be put into, and which is consolidated by the concept of AUKUS, which is in fact, something that was born in the 1940s, like I was, and has been with you ever since, and has really been very subterranean, but which Richard has documented to an ex an, a considerable extent about how it's been organized. Um, the civil servants are also saying that <clears throat> they're advising their prime minister, the English British civil servants are advising them, them that the Australian Prime Minister has got a fair point. They risked this for us, they undertook this for us, they were exposed to various dangers for us, and we can't just walk away without leaving them anything behind. There was a strong sentiment that Australia should be given a tactical, at least nuclear weapons defence in the 1960s. And it was a legalistic thing. And this is why I keep saying, where's the constitutional lawyers who understand the importance of this and have the skills to understand it? Um, as distinct from us simple-minded political scientists um, about really how compliant, how collusive, how competent in the legal sense was Menzies and his government and chiefly before him in making these commitments. Was he French Polynesia or uh, Algeria or other countries? Was he a dominated um, Prime Minister of a dominated country, or was did he have a sufficient executive competence as a dominion in the British Empire to acquiesce in these things? And if he did acquiesce, collude, agree with these plans, then does that, if he was in a nation state called Australia, does that not make that nation state, also a nuclear state, just as much as what used to be called the mother country, Britain. The Prime Minister, Macmillan said, indicated his keenness to help the Australians in this quandary as they were preparing to leave the region. But of course, I would have to check with the Americans first. Here in this part of his letter, which is in the Mianjin article, Menzies makes it very clear that the reason that he's asking for this uh, confirmation that there will be a nuclear arsenal left in Australia is because Australia will be prohibited from developing its own by the forthcoming treaty. And that even as it is, there's a strong danger that the Soviets will insist on monitoring posts in Australia. And remember the Cold War and what that would have meant to have an international treaty that uh, promulgated the need for monitoring nuclear weapons development in the continental territory of Australia. And Menzies is saying, you know, let's get this sorted before the treaty comes down and stops us. And remember, there's the 1956 Olympics coming along, but there's the treaty coming along very soon afterwards. And Menzies is not willing or inclined or suggests that they go slow until after the Olympics are over in case there is some pollution of the territory. 
the um, politicians and the civil servants in London had been bombarded by Professor Tiddleton and Sir Leslie Martin, who was here from Melbourne, who were members of the Atomic Weapons Safety Committee to endorse this request this begging that Menzies needed to be left with an arsenal. And remember the Cold War situation at the time with Korea and Indonesia and so forth. Um, there was a mood in London that Menzies did have a reasonable point. What I want to look at next is what was going on in Australia? What were the British trying to get done and finished? so urgently that they didn't really stop during the 1956 Olympic Games and certainly resumed very soon afterwards. Uh, now, in 1957, Britain started testing thermonuclear as distinct from atomic weapons in tests called grapple, which Nick has uh, dealt with so importantly in 1957 and 1958. And Britain is said to have achieved an H-bomb, a hydrogen bomb, otherwise known in some complicated linguistic terminological circles as a thermonuclear bomb. In one of those tests, there was a series of tests, and we'll see why there had to be a series of tests. But what was happening was that from after the first detonation at Montebello in 1952, 70 years ago this month this year, which was atomic, which was concerned with testing the um, ability to sink ships and vessels in a harbor because that was a preoccupation with people after the American situation. That's what the Americans were doing in their tests at this time. After that, I'm saying, and I, I'm saying it from documentary evidence that you can boggle your eyes following, uh, that the, uh, the British program consisted of two things in tandem. One was the development of atomic weaponry. The other was the field testing of the components for thermonuclear weaponry, which culminated in the first tests in 1957-58. So, um, we'll see later that one of the official historians says, the British official historian says, wasn't it marvellous that the British could move from Australia to Christmas Island and Molden Island and set off, how many bombs it was, Nick, I forgot, six, seven bombs, nine, thank you, good to have a specialist support there, um, without any testing, that they could go take nine bombs and blow them off and have varying degrees of success. Well, the trouble, the trouble with that analysis is it's not true. They didn't just do stuff in London at Oldermaston or wherever and then ship it out to uh, Molden and Christmas Island. They field tested all the way along in Australia. And those field tests are most commonly, not totally, but most commonly carried out in what was known as the trials, as distinct from the uh, detonations of the actual bombs. Um, the, I just show you this, uh, sorry, Alice just taught me how to do this. This uh, photograph is from uh, March, no, May 1956, the top one of the, sign on the vessel coming into Fremantle from the mosaic tests in the Montebellos, the second set of Montebello tests. It's coming into Fremantle and it's got this sign on it. This ship is irradiated, keep out. And the people on the ship, amongst them being the man who sent me the photograph, this is them in their working uniform during all their time dealing with the tests. And the lower rank you were, the less clothes you were because you're doing the dirtier jobs and you got hotter. Um, and those are the sort of men that I was working with about the health issues. But as I'm saying, the, the development of the British H-bomb actually started back as soon as the Second World War ended 
in the 1940s. The official histories date it to 1954 or 1956. That was 10 years after a huge amount of work was being done by uh, William Penny on an agenda that had been agreed with the scientific committees and with the British government and was slowly leaked out to the Australian government that actually by the time they tested their first atom bomb, which is this rather uh, unperpendicular blast, this is five shots of the same bomb, the um, hurricane bomb in October 1952. You can see how on top of the art they were by then. Um, the, the test that, that was the only pure atomic bomb test. After that, within days, the United States and the Soviet Union had both gone thermonuclear. This was a baby bomb. And in fact, in the science of it, an atomic bomb becomes a trigger detonator initiator the, the amount of heat generated, which we used to think was so huge by an atomic bomb, is what you require to ignite a nuclear bomb. So in nuclear tests, you have two systems. You have the atomic initiator, the baby bomb, and then you have the big bomb, which you're trying to get up into the megaton range. And that's what they were trying to do and would seem to have achieved in 1957. But from the beginning, is that me? Sorry, it was me. <laughs> what they're trying to do from the beginning, and here's some of the data that we've got for evidence for this. Catherine Pine was one of the official historians who worked with the official official historian, Lorna Arnold. Penny and Cockcroft were starting to think nuclear and reporting nuclear plans in 1952, in the months before that little piddling atomic bomb went off. Eden refers to this in his memoirs. Another interesting aspect of this is the role of Klaus Fuchs, if anybody goes back there. Now, Klaus Fuchs was accused not of uh, treason or of espionage uh, because he was a salaried member of British scientific establishment and he had legal classification to legal access to the material that he was sharing. What he um, was imprisoned for was uh, not harming British interest by collaborating with Soviet, our former allies in the Second World War, but through official Secrets Acts type of offences. Yeah, I think he got 14 years in prison and he was out in seven. He was over in Europe in his home universities and so forth, um, working fully as a physicist. In other words, he got slapped on the wrist for what the Americans were executing people for at the same time. And one reason for that is increasingly thought to be that Fuchs was one of the men who had come back from Los Alamos with a fair knowledge of what Edward Teller was up to with the super bomb and moving to the thermonuclear. So we're, there was this guy who had a very odd set of values um, about that required him to share everything he knew in order to prevent, it was like um, mutually assured destruction type uh, philosophy that uh, if everybody had it, nobody could afford to use it. And he was going to promulgate that. Um, there is evidence that he was being helpful from inside prison during the years that he was in Britain and perhaps negotiated an earlier release uh, because of this support or cooperation with the British attempt to go thermonuclear. I'll pass over because of time passing over, but you can catch it on the slides if and when they come out on, the, sorry, getting stuffy. Um, but Fuchs was there and he had more knowledge than the rest of them due to particular circumstances. And then he goes and blots his copy book, something terribly, gets put in prison, prison, but the scientists visit him and try and extract information from him about 
the British attempt to develop a thermonuclear capacity. So they're, they're manufacturing atomic, which they knew how to do very well because Frisch and Pearls had given the information to Oliphant in Birmingham, who had taken it to America and told Oppenheimer and a few other people. And that ended up in the whole Los Alamos experience. Um, but what the British didn't have that the Americans did have, and which the Soviets proved to have, was a faster manufacturing capacity of what was now essentially an engineering task to make atom bombs on the basis of the Frisch and Pearls memorandum. This is another piece of evidence that um, the scientists were beginning to think about thermonuclear weapons far earlier than 1954. Um, sorry, the official historian Lorna Arnold begins to suspect this. Mosaic G1 and G2 were, are now accepted to be, and she accepted it to be eventually, to have been a fusion detonation, not a fission detonation. And you can look up the difference between fission and fusion in the encyclopedias and um, find that one is the separation and one is the fusion of atomic particles to create energy. But they were moving to fusion, which would create much greater values of bomb power and were called thermonuclear in the language. Penny, the director of scientific development for the British weapons program, distinguished between four types of weapons that he told the politicians and other people that, that this was the way to go scientifically. We can make straight fission weapons, atomic weapons, tiddly weapons. We can boost those fission weapons with uh, thermonuclear elements or we could change the proportion to make the thermonuclear the dominant component of a bomb. But to do that, we would have to trigger it by creating atomic bombs to start off. And that very precise work. I mean, you get it wrong and you could lose the planet or something. Moving to thermonuclear weapons. Then these, this was the agenda that culminated in grapple and the test that Nick and others have reported. But the work, the development work, didn't come off the drawing board like Lorna Arnold suggested. It came from the tests and the trials, and I can document them one by one, and I have in those uh, online materials, um, progressively through really concentrating in the period between May, May 1956 and October 1956, where the most critical um, preparatory tests were made for the grapple tests that came a few weeks after the 1956 Olympics. But the powers that be couldn't see their way to not continuing the tests, even though you had these several thousand people um, coming into the country and being vulnerable to the food chain irradiation if and when it occurred. The official documents and the official historian don't tell it that way because the Lorna Arnold, the woman who wrote the relevant books here, she believed completely the British statement that they had promised never to test thermonuclear in Australia. And I have another article which shows you the 20 or so times this was said in Melbourne or Canberra or London, we will not test thermonuclear, we'll stick to atomic in Australia. But even Lorna Arnold eventually had to concede that starting in May, and I would say earlier in the Kittens trials of uh, 53 at Emu Field, that starting in 1956, running up towards the Olympics, those tests definitely took, turned to being important thermonuclear field tests for what was happening at, would happen at Grapple. 
the um, what I, I'm saying, and I wish other people would look at the, the construction of this and say, well, is she right or is she wrong? And where's the evidence? And I would say down in the archives, well, they're still open. But uh, from the off, from the off, middle 40s into 1952, the first atomic detonation, there was always that full agenda of those four types of tests. There was a date given for 1957 because the atmospheric treaty would come down any minute and prevent atmospheric testing. And the British had to get their stuff completed, give or take the Olympic games coming along at an unfortunate conjunction. And I also argue, and I think I can document totally happily to my satisfaction, that what was going on at Woomera was part and parcel of what was going on at Maralinga, Emu Field, and uh, Montebello's, which may sound uh, counterintuitive, but I would say that, and there is a gradual slight appreciation in the official histories that the Woomera tests were testing the delivery systems of the tactical and strategic ballistic missiles that were replacing the bombs. So that, you know, you tested the stuff over here, but then you had to deliver it and you had to have certain missile developments and so forth. So that you have to see, and people so rarely do, see Woomera and the, uh, the bomb tests as being part and part of the same weaponizing weapons development of the British Australian Alliance. This is an, uh, a statement that you can find in the Mianjin piece, I think, or in one of my other pieces, but it's on there and you can uh, track it down again. But this is a statement by British senior civil servants who are preparing for a ministerial visit to Australia, that they're advising their minister, you've got to be careful because we promised the Australians we would never go thermonuclear. Now we are going thermonuclear and the most important Australians know we're going thermonuclear on their territory, but you must walk very gently through this minefield. Um, and there he would say, we've said we would not test thermonuclear in Australia, but Menzies has nevertheless agreed to um, the firings taking place. The true character of these tests is understood by the authorities immediately concerned. Now, the consequence is, and when any end, in the end you'll be glad to know that um, this rather fragile image, I'm afraid, comes from a very recent Arpanza report, um, a government publicity sort of report that tells the Australian public and anyone else who wants to know how many tests there occurred in Australia after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is the red test at the beginning, the, red, um, uh, the detonations. And you'll see the big tall tower one, which is G2, mosaic G2 in May 1956, it was said at the time to be 60 kilotons. It is now acknowledged in Australian government material to have been 98 kilotons. And you can see how it vastly outranks the other uh, yields that are recorded or estimated for Australian tests. And you'll notice if you do up the arithmetic, um, despite the you can find it on online easily by reference in the text to be able to see it because you can see how things really speeded up to the point where 140 kilotons of the 200 kilotons claimed in Australia as yields for British testing. 140 of them happened in the six months before the 1956 Olympics. And just to get back to really, really basics, as Neville Shute knew, the winds flow westerly from Maralinga, Montebello's, Emu Field, Woomera, to Adelaide, to Melbourne, to Sydney. 
the winds flow westerly. And these days, poor scientists of the day beyond, these days you and I can look back at the historical meteorological records, which I have printed in my book, and we can show what the weather systems was like on the East Coast when these detonations were being made. Another thing, just to um, show you how much work there still need to be done, any one of us could go online and click on these links and look at this detonation here, which is the kite explosion um, of, the, I think, almost the last one before the Olympic Games. Now, there's a difference between an air burst weapon and a ground burst weapon. Who thinks that is a ground burst weapon? Who think it detonated on the ground, the surface of the island? You're right. If, if it was an air burst, it would have um, detonated in the air, not Oops, not on the ground. See that disturbance on the ground? That's the, um, the sand and debris being lifted up by the explosion going up in there. Now you can actually see it happen online at the moment. If you go to this next slide, is yes, now that's clear. Now that looks nice and empty sky, doesn't it? Now there's an aeroplane coming in here, um, may well have been one of your relatives, I don't know, flying in or observing in the aeroplane and dropping what was supposed to be the first airburst of a British bomb in preparation for the airburst drops that were going to be done at uh, Molden and Christmas Island in Grapple in a few months hence. Now there it is, and there's the clear sky, and there's the detonation that you've just seen a variation of. If it was an air burst, it should be bursting in the sky and coming down, as you were saying, but it's not. The bomb kite hit the ground. It failed to detonate because the triggers didn't work. So that was an interesting experiment, wasn't it? And they had to fix that before they went to grapple because otherwise their nuclear, thermonuclear bombs might have detonated in the more dangerous um, mode than before. It's very, um, uh, what do you say? It's very easy to test these things out. If you've got enough time, God forbid that we should all be locked down again. But if you are, just look at these sites and remember to use the timing button and very delicately, this is in the first second, this is you know barely a second between the first image and the second image. There is no aeroplane dropping a bomb onto the thing. The bomb has fallen and it's hitting the ground. And until this day, it is still classified by the Australian government and the British government as an airburst in preparation for grapple and the thermonuclear bombs. I just quickly uh, want to suggest something to you. Uh, you might say, what, what more? provocative things can she think to say now? Because um, what I'm saying is that we have completely misunderstood Menzies' role in the uh, collusion and decisions to make the H-bomb, not just the A-bomb, but the H-bomb in Australia, though they did take it away to uh, burst it on other people's territories, not on ours. But I want you to think at these delicate moments, what all this is, if you think back on it, there have been 2,000 nuclear, atomic, thermonuclear, whatever, 2,000 detonations since 1945. 1,000 of those have been in America, in the four contiguous states around New Mexico and the testing sites there. And then apart from those explosions into the atmosphere of radiation pollution and so forth. We've had Hiroshima and Nagasaki themselves. 
we've had um what would be the next one wind scale reactor explosion accident it was mark oliphant who said a nuclear reactor which i want to build in camera is a static atomic bomb so you've got them all over the place and they give us our electricity and all the rest of it in britain we can't live more than 50 miles away from one in effect um i managed to buy a house directly opposite one um we've had wind scale we've had three mile island tri-state highly populated american industrial area we've had chernobyl and we've had fukushima where if COVID hadn't intervened the baseball competitions for the olympic games would have been held i didn't know they had baseball and the olympic games but i read at the time you can find it online that it was scheduled for fukushima what i'm saying is with the exception of chernobyl all those sites are repopulated reused are you seeing where i'm going we've got 2000 going off we've got you know a dozen nuclear reactors and maybe ukraine's going next we don't know um and yet and here's the really icky part we have to survive them we have survived them those of us who survived them did survive them which means that if you were of a mindset of a putin or another leader who was talking about tactical nuclear missiles you're talking a whole new ball game of actually doable stuff which in some ways is no more injurious to the planet than many of another thing that we've done remember for instance that more people died of spanish flu after the first world war than died in the first world war of military exercises so i'm just saying oops we need to really rethink where we are 70 years later and to worry that perhaps our military leaders and a few politicians are already ahead of us to think of what the next phase could be like now i must allow you to raise objections thank you for listening so thank you very much that's a, a, a detailed if um somewhat sobering <laughs> coverage of a very important issue so um if there are any questions in the room just please stick your hand up we've got a roving mic which will come around i'd just like to pitch um one in first and zoom you at the at the beginning you talked about um the aboriginals are, are you aware of whether the australian authorities made efforts before any of those tests to account for the aboriginal population in the neighborhood is, is there anything in the archives that suggests that yes didn't? there is it's um it's in archives and it's in books uh that there were <laughs> safety officers um men on horses men in in trucks and so forth who were supposed to survey the population of the area and warn them to get out but first you had to find them and then you had to communicate with them in in languages and so forth and it's generally considered to have been rather ineffectual i think the whole aboriginal question is an interesting one because they were actually the people who advocated most strongly for reparations and and successfully and it's very interesting to see how that came about but that's another hour and you don't have that <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not protesting. I'm just I'm in awe of what you already said. Um, the, 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 the question that there are so many questions, but one that I would really like to ask, particularly after your very last comments, that because I'm hearing from the region, uh, from other news sources than Australian sources, that a nuclear um a nuclear missile might actually be utilized in the region where there is active war going on 
between Russia and Ukraine, are you saying that it could actually be a real thing to happen? Because some people might think that, look, we've survived the previous ones and there'll be survival after this. Therefore, this is a this is something that's a goal. I think what I'm saying is that uh, tactical nuclear missiles and then strategic nuclear missiles and then nuclear bombs like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, big ones on cities, there, it's a question of precision. And in previous forms of warfare, like uh, firebombing and other sorts of things, it came to be called precision firebombing. If you could really focus on a town and really focus on industrial and other facilities that you really wanted to take out, and these days you can do it by drone, but using pre-nuclear, pre-atomic, that's commonplace now, commonplace. I'm just saying that some people have anticipated the day when tactical, which is a smaller nuclear missile, could come from a submarine or an aircraft or whatever means of delivery, which we would go to Woomera to understand more about. Um, and it could be used very precisely as a demonstration in a relatively unpopulated or perhaps actually unpopulated area, if there are any left in the world, a warning sign, you know, we're going to do this if you don't do what we want to do. Or worst case scenario, you could take out Miami and you could close off Florida, but you would leave as Three Mile Island is left, the rest of the United States still functioning. And that's, I, I think it's in the minds of worst case scenario people. Nick. So th thank you very much for fascinating with so many questions. Um, <laughs> Could write a book on it, couldn't you? Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> you made the connection between the testing in Australia as connected to the thermonuclear testing in Kiribati. Mm -hmm. So why did they stop in Australia? Um, I mean, I, I've written that there about, it was a Commonwealth bomb. They approached New Zealand looking for places to test. They had Canada developing tritium and, you know, the White River nuclear reactor. And mm -hmm. I mean, they were drawing on the Anglophone nations, Australia, New Zealand, Canada to support them. So given that they were starting thermonuclear work in Australia, why did they stop? Why did they end up going to Kiribati rather than continue after 1957? I think they knew or felt, and probably rightly, that they couldn't carry the Menzies government with them to go that far. He was going out on the limb far enough to allow what he did allow. He was keeping so much secret. He was um, holding an election. And then as soon as he got re-elected, the next week he'd agree to something more when he was feeling secure. He never put it to the Australian population. Um, the press was actually surprisingly alert, and there's a lot to be learned from Trove and other places. But I think Australia, which was then about eight or 10 million people in major uh, uh, eastern and Perth cities, I think they might have made more objection than the Kiribati or Kiribati's. Um, those were small islands, and they were not able to mobilize against it. But I think even the Australians would have noticed, and I'm sure there would have been a, a tremendous outcry against uh, Menzies. Now we have to remember throughout this whole story that it started with the Labour government. It started with Chipley, and it started with a vision of a Commonwealth nuclear capacity for civil engineering, medical and weaponry things. I, I also thought that the Bravo test, the American, the biggest American test on Bikini Atoll in 1954, which was a total disaster, raised international attention because yes. of the Japanese fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon, yeah. and that sparked global mobilisation. I mean, Neville wrote, Neville Shute wrote a book yeah. that sold four million copies, which is a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> And they made a Hollywood movie about it and things like that, that there, you know, there was a shift 
midway there, through all of this. There was a public understanding. There's a very 5,000 word article in the New Yorker, I think it is, um, about the Bravo test and the Japanese uh, irradiation. And of course, there was this mounting understanding of what this would mean. But there was also the pressure of the atmospheric test ban treating coming down. And Britain wanted to be, as people were said, they wanted to be at the top table with the Americans, the Russians, whoever else was going to have these things. And they developed it in Australia. They wore out their welcome here, moved over there, did it, and really have had a price to pay since in terms of credibility, but it got them back into alliance immediately with the Americans. And what I'm saying is a subtext also is that AUKUS began during the Second World War, um, British, Australian, American. My father came to Australia in the US Navy during the Second World War to help defend against the offenses of the North and so forth as, a, as an American sailor. I mean, ever since those forces arrived in the immediate aftermath, Menzies had been spending quite a bit of time in Washington with Roosevelt. He had close talks with Roosevelt. When he walked out of his prime ministership here and went to London, he spent a lot of time with Roosevelt in Washington. And I think like any sensible person, he was having plan B thoughts and you know, the British don't look so clever at the moment, and these Americans may well uh, be necessary to us, annoying as they are, and that ever since then, and then of course it became a question of uranium, the um, American uranium prospectors were here very, very quickly when uranium was an urgent requirement of their development program. The Australian uranium was sold off to those interests. So the the American interest got embedded in the uranium supply line. Woomera was formed in 1947. And it, if you just look through it, it just seems so obvious to me, just from what's online, that it is a commercialized form of Anglo-American British space stroke nuclear weaponry. And it's the basis of what the military people call interoperability. If you're going to have weapons and you're going to have a team, you've all got to be able to, to interoperate, you know, in terms of the what that's what these submarines are about and so forth. Um, we've had interoperability with the Americans since 1947, at least. And the question is whether we were wise to do that or stupid to do that. But I do say to you, and I say to people that I meet during my visit at the moment, I say, and so what is plan B if we don't rely on the Americans coming to us? Uh, what, what will you do then? And you get a very blank stare. And that's reality. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your very good and very detailed uh, speech tonight. Uh, you have uh, answered some of my uh, parts of my question. Uh, one of the things that I'm still not uh, completely sure of was from Menzies on, uh, my understanding is that very, very little information or intelligence was uh, given to the public that we didn't know uh, the extent to which Australia was co cozying up to, to bombs. And the other thing I just want to, to ask, to what extent you believe uh, we were either lied to or not, Told. And the other was Diamond Jim McClellan. Remember, he he, yeah. he uh, was a friend of mine, but he he did a, a bit, but I can't quite remember what what he came out with in the end from his 
he was told to look through the hole. Thomas, so. The last question or last point first. Um, I show in my book um, that uh, Justice McClellan pulled his punches. He did not report things that were known then. And he was also conflicted by an extreme personality clash with Professor Ernest Titterton, who was the man who had detonated the first ever atomic bomb in July 1945, was now professor at ANU and chairman of the Atomic Weapons Safety Committee. And my analysis is that uh, McClellan and Titterton both had very strong personalities. And Titterton ended up being scapegoated for a whole lot of things that went on, which actually were um, within his remit in his understanding with Menzies and with the British government, which is not to say that he didn't do a lot of very unfortunate things, devious and deceptive, but he was very committed to Australia having a nuclear bomb too. The question of how much we've been lied to all my life is, um, I, you know, you have to respect the need of governments to maintain secrecy and caution and so forth. But there are some things that Britain would have put out to referendum or to election discussion, like uh, Trident and other things. Australia doesn't seem to go that way. But it's not just nuclear. I remember uh, in the 1960s when we were all worried about Indonesia, particularly, and Richard was active in these activities as well as myself. And we always used to say, what is it about Labour and the opposition parties? When they're out of government, they're so, their platforms on Indonesia are so strong and good and sensible. The moment they get into government, they must be handed a folder of some sort that completely converts them into um, no speaker the secrets to the poi polloi. And I think politicians are naturally, you know, uh, educated very suddenly when they do take office into very important issues. And it's a big judgment call about how and when you're going to share the information with the population. But after all, what can we complain about? They've told us about the submarines, they've told us about AUKUS. All I'm saying is it's just a rubber stamp of what's been doing for the past 70 years, and perhaps we'll be glad of it one day or not. But I'd like to see what the alternative is before I make my choice. Hope that helps. <laughs> we're, we're, we're nearly out of time. Mike, if we can just do one last quick question. Thank you. Thank you. That was really very uh, enlightening. My question is about HV Evert, um, Minister for External Affairs in the Chifley government. Um, very strongly supportive of the United Nations, in fact, uh, headed up the UNGA in 1948, I think. To what extent do you think that Evert and by implication, the Department of External Affairs uh, were involved in this, or was it really more either Prime Minister or Defence Department? Uh, the trouble with Evert is that he was uh, blackballed the same way that Mark Oliphant was, for being too sympathetic to the extent of going to cocktail parties in Canberra at the Soviet embassy with Soviet um, colleagues. He was considered a very loose tongue, a very loose office. You could walk into his office unlocked. The file cabinets were unlocked. You've had this more recently in cabinet uh, in Canberra, but it happened back then. And there are plenty of files on file about how irascible, completely raged the Americans were, the Americans were about this high level Australian politician being a loose cannon, a softy, a lefty, a fellow traveler. And he was very much cauterized, quarantined. The same thing happened to Mark Oliphant. And there was a big spy scandal in Canberra. And one of the most major spy candles or scandals in the world originated in the Canberra embassy of the Soviet Union and the uh, undoing or the decoding of the critical files about Soviet 
relationships with its agents around the world started in Canberra. The British sent out a very high powered team of British intelligence managers to Canberra to try and close it down, to try and get it cauterized because they wanted to get back into alliance with the Americans who thought Australian security was a rubbish from the bottom to the top. So Everett was a man of great heart, I think, and but he got caught in the middle. Well, Sue, thank you. Yeah. That, that unfortunately brings us to the end. It, it was such a complex topic. We didn't quite get through all the questions, but um, what we'll do, we'll send, if you permit, a copy of your slides out. Um, we'll also send a link to Nick's book on the grappling of the bomb, which uh, ties in with this mm -hmm. as well. Um, so thank you for, for coming all this way from Scotland, giving us such an erudite and detailed coverage of an extremely complex topic, but very important. So thank you very thank much. You very much. Please join me. Thank you.